this bug was reported yesterday. This is a missing bounce check. So this is the kind of thing that happens all the time in C programs. This is a fairly subtle one, so we'll look at the code. And the impact of this bug is that about 64 kilobytes of memory could be revealed to the client. So a client connects to a website using SSL and gets back some chunk of 64 kilobytes of memory extracted from that program. So we talked about the Apple go to fail SSL bug. Which one sounds more severe? Yes. This one. Why does this one sound more severe? OK, good. So one issue of severity is, is how widely deployed is the software that, that has this problem. And in both cases, it was pretty widely deployed software. In the Apple go to fail, well, it only applied to iOS and Mac OS X and only to certain applications like Safari. This is part of OpenSSL, which most web servers are using. Apache uses this, and I think probably about 60% or so of web servers are using this code. Could be higher than 60%, but it's, it's a, definitely a majority of all the web servers on the internet are running code that's using OpenS, OpenSSL. So from that perspective, it definitely affects a lot more machines. Actually, maybe that's, that's not actually true because the iOS is all the clients. This is affecting all the servers. The other question about severity is what can an attacker do to exploit this? The Apple bug, an attacker, if they could intercept your traffic, could get you to accept a bad certificate. It was going to go to fail even when it shouldn't, and it was skipping the checks to validate that the certificate's OK. This bug, it's just sending back a chunk of memory. So in terms of how dangerous it is to be exploited, which one is worse? How would we decide if this is bad? The impact of this bug is someone can visit your server as a client, send it a particular request, and as long as you've got this heartbeat extensions turned on, which most servers do, your server is going to send back a chunk of 64 kilobytes of the process's memory space for the client to see. What should we be worried about in that memory space? Is that a big problem if a client can see our memory? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so what would be the most, so that's 64K of the process, right? So it's not just the OpenSSL code, because that OpenSSL code is embedded in the web browser, so it's that whole web browser process. What's the most interesting thing that could be in that 64K as far as an attacker's concerned? Yeah, right. So that 64K is quite likely to include the server's private key. And if that server's private key is exposed, well then any session that's encrypted between that server and client can now be broken. And anyone who has that private key can also impersonate that server. So this is a much more serious bug than the Apple one. The Apple one, in order to exploit it, you had to be able to intercept packets between the client and the server and replace them with your own. So you had to be able to access the wireless access point or some other point in the middle and intercept and modify that traffic. This one, all you've got to do is connect to the server, which every open web server allows you to do. And if you send it the right messages, you get their private key back, which is a very, very undesirable thing to have happen. So what was the bug? Here's the code that processes the heartbeat request. And this is just a request you can send to a web server to get some information back. We're going to zoom in on this a little bit. But it's not, it's not too much code. It's a, it's a fairly small chunk of code that is enough to understand the vulnerability. And we've looked at examples of C code in a couple of classes. So we look at the Apache SU exec code, and I at least claim that was really good C code that gave me a warm and fuzzy feeling about using Apache. We looked at the Apple SSL go to fail code, which to me looked like really horrible code that you would expect to have lots of security vulnerabilities in even before you find them. <laughs> What do we think of this code? Is this more like Apache's code or more like Apple's SSL code? So do you like the code? It seems people are fairly happy with it. There's nothing you don't like about the style or the, the way it's written. So it has some comments. Do we like the comments? At least see someone's saying they don't like the comment. What, what do you not like about the comments? I, I agree on both of those. So the, the comments, there are comments there more annoying than useful to me, right? There are comments about things that are obvious from the code, like the random padding comment that you mentioned that something that is called ran pseudobytes and passes in padding, probably you don't need to comment to know that that's random padding. It would be a lot more useful if the comment explained, here's why we need to add random padding here, rather than just telling you that, yeah, I'm calling something that is obviously doing random padding for, for the names. 
And other things like this comment really doesn't help you understand much what's going on. So there are comments there. They look like comments mostly added for the sake of adding comments, not for helping someone understand the code. The one that's kind of good is this one. So this one explains where the one and the two and, and the payload and padding are. So that comment is sort of helpful, but it also, to me, is sort of bad coding. Here they calculate one plus two plus payload plus, plus padding. Here they calculate three plus payload plus padding. Here they calculate three plus payload plus padding. So they're calculating the same thing three times. Sometimes they separate the one plus two, and sometimes they are able to do that in their head and get three. But it's, in my view, pretty bad coding style to compute something like that three times rather than giving it a variable and explaining this is the size that you need. The other stylistic thing about, yeah, should you always have braces around the ifs? Certainly not syntactically necessary to have them, but in terms of readability, it probably would be a good idea, especially when you have something that complicated inside. So it certainly does not give me the kind of warm, fuzzy feeling reading the Apache SU exec code does. Some of these things are definitely subjective. But it's also the kind of thing that by making the code harder to read, they increase the likelihood that there are bugs in it that are really important, and they make it harder for other people to read it and review it and find those bugs. Now let's actually look at this in a little more detail. The call that is most directly the vulnerability of this memcopy. What memcopy does is it takes three parameters. So the first two are addresses, the second is the length. It is copying n bytes, so the third parameter is the number of bytes to copy. It's copying from the second object into the first one. And this is unsafe C code. It's just going to copy that larger chunk of memory, whether that's part of the object or not. So what is the safety requirement on using memcopy? Good. So what, what do we need to know about the values of S1 and S2 that are passed in? Yeah, so we need to know that those pointers, both S1 and S2, point to some block of size at least n. S2 points to some block of size at least n. Is it okay if they point to the same block or point inside each other? Without looking at the code, we might not be sure about that, but the spec actually says the behavior is undefined if they overlap. So there's another safety condition that those pointers can't be pointing to any storage that overlaps within the first n bytes. That, that actually is not the issue here. The issue is, is the size of these. So anytime memcopy is used, code, we need to be sure that that safety property is, is guaranteed. The value that's being passed in a mem copy, PL comes from P, which comes from this record. So that's filled up based on a packet that comes in from the network, and it's this data structure. So we've got a field data that's a pointer to the record data. That's something that came in from an external untrusted user. And we've got a field length that's supposed to keep track of how much space we have. What happens? inside processing the heartbeat that came in is we've assigned P as a pointer to the beginning of that structure. So that's where P is pointing. And then we incremented it by one. So we read the type into HB type. And then we use this N2S. What N2S does is takes those two bytes, paste them together, and makes a 16-bit integer out of them. That is taking these two values and storing it in payload. Then we're going to be using payload as the size of the buffer. We're using memcopy, filling up this new buffer that was allocated. And the allocation here uses the payload and the padding and the 1 plus 2. So this is the one that we looked at on the previous slide that had a little bit of a comment about why there's 1 plus 2 there. Do we see any problems with this? So what, what could go wrong with this code? And remember, our safety property for the memcopy is the size of this object has to be at least n. Because if S2 was, let's say, it's this size, whatever happens to be here in memory, that's also getting copied into S1. What's happening with what's getting copied into S1, so what's getting copied into BP, BP is eventually being sent back in the response. So whatever was there is now getting put in this buffer that's getting sent back to the client. So if it turned out that our safety property wasn't guaranteed, this big chunk of memory is getting copied into S1 and sent back to the client in the response, not just what was supposed to be in that data object. Okay. So that's our big worry, to know that this payload value, which is set from these two bytes in the data that came from the user who connected to our server, to know that that's not bigger than the actual amount of space allocated for this data. Well, 
these things are coming from our external user. Right? This is just some chunk of data that came in in a web request. In order for that request to be correct, these values and the length of the data should match. There's certainly no requirement that they do. An attacker can set those values to whatever they want. And what should an attacker set them to? Yeah. Yeah. This is why it's 64K, right? They can set them to all ones. 16 bits of ones is 64K. And what we're going to get copied back is other than a few bytes that are wasted because they were in proper data, everything else in that chunk of memory, which if we're lucky as an attacker or unlucky as the server owner, has somewhere in here has our private key. So this is really bad. The majority of web servers are running Apache or Nginx or some server that's using OpenSSL and have this heartbeat feature turned on so are vulnerable to this, unless they fixed it after yesterday, which probably not too many have yet. There is a fix in the code. So this is what the OpenSSL maintainers did to fix this. They check if the size of this is too small to hold the padding, they give up. So that wasn't really the specific vulnerability, but something else they noticed in looking at this that maybe that would be a good idea to check. Then they checked if the computed value is greater than the length. And this is the one that's really most directly fixing this bug. Right? It's saying if the length of this buffer that was allocated that you're reading from is less than the size of the claim payload plus the size of your buffer, then we're going to exit here returning zero. And then they clean this up a little bit, adding these into variable and use write length instead of and check that it's not bigger than some maximum value. So are we starting to get a, a warm and fuzzy feeling about the OpenSSL code? That at least they were able to fix this. Do we like the fix? As far as I can understand, I think it does actually prevent this vulnerability. It's checking that that buffer is big enough. Are there things we still don't like about it? Yeah. yeah. OK, good. Certainly, as part of the fix, we would also like to see a new test case or several new test cases. Something like this should be verified in the testing. Now, this is a somewhat hard thing to test for, much harder to test for than the Apple vulnerability. You would have to generate the right exploit packet and get the response. So it's not surprising that they didn't have this in their test suite to begin with, but you would like to have seen them add it in response to this. There are other things that I don't like about this code. So what is the 16? Why are they adding 16 to all of these? Yeah, so it's this value of padding. We've got a you know, helpful but not really helpful comment that says that's the minimum padding. Much prefer that to be a global variable or a macro that sets that value. Then it's used as a hard constant without using this padding. And it's not clear to me why they made padding a variable. I don't think the padding, maybe the value of padding does change somewhere and it's dot dot out of, out of my code. But that's pretty annoying. And I think it's also pretty annoying to have 1 plus 2 plus 16 in their code. To me, this is evidence that, well, they fixed it, but they really don't get it yet. This is the kind of fix that suggests there are thousands and thousands of more bugs in OpenSSL that just are waiting to be discovered. Unfortunately, if you want to use Apache, you are using OpenSSL. So maybe there's more hope for our Zeta server than I thought, but we don't have an SSL implementation for it. So someone would have to implement one that is much, much more robust and safe than OpenSSL.